I will call the meeting to order. And I uh, would ask if you stand, if you're able, and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to go a little out of order uh, for the moment because I'm going to go right to the superintendent's report just very briefly. Mr. Lynch. Yes, Mr. Young, members of the committee, uh, good evening and welcome. I'd like to invite Derek Thompson down to the podium for a moment and along with some friends that he brought along. Um, he's become personal friends with them, but they're also good friends of the district. Uh, it is our local Rotary Club and they sponsor the Rotary Raise program. Mr. Thompson, welcome. Thank you. I didn't really have any remarks prepared tonight, but um, just excited to be able to be here tonight just to public, publicly acknowledge the Rotary for all their work. Um, I think we're on five years completed of the Rotary Raise. So the Rotary has donated um, almost $12,000 to us every year. We've run an innovative, innovative after-school tutoring program, intensive program, 16 weeks where we're working with uh, fourth and fifth graders after school, targeting kids who have had low growth and low achievement in MCAS. Um, roughly, our growth numbers um, are averaging over 60. So we've had years where our average growth percentiles are in the 70s. We've had them over 60. They've always been over 60. Typical growth numbers for kids are between 40 to 60. So it's not normal to see kids with growth above 60. Um, and we've been averaging that with all the kids. We have some um, unbelievable success stories of kids in the Rotary. I know that folks on the Rotary have heard from kids later that, have, that we've worked with years ago. Um, so it's just been an incredible program. It's been a real difference maker for us. They're, we're working with kids at both Mary Kay Good and HBB. We work with um, around 50 kids every year, usually a few more than that, um, because the teachers will take in a couple extras. Um, and it's just been an enormously successful program, and I'm just glad we get to publicly acknowledge and say thank you for the donation and the hard work of the Rotary. And Mr. Thompson, if I might, the MCAS, Next Generation MCAS, specifically identifies subgroups uh, and specifically rewards schools for how well they do with some subgroups. We know we're going to have certain students who do extremely well on the MCAS every year, but it's that lower subgroup, uh, the subgroup you've identified, yep. that if we can actually quantify substantial growth in that area, um, the school is recognized, and your school has been recognized in that area. Yeah, we have. So. HPB was a level three school for our performance in special ed. We were in the bottom 20th percentile for a while. Um, some of you that have been here for a while heard my disagreements with some of those numbers for a while. We are in a much better place with that. We're in a great place with that. Um, but really, it's been a combination of efforts, this being one of them, in targeting those kids that have struggled and finding outside the box ways to target and help those kids and move them forward. And this is one of those ways. So it's been a huge help and it's gonna be even more important going forward. The new MCAS, half of our accountability uh, starting this year is rooted in our ability to move our 20, bottom 25% of our kids. So programs like this go a really long way. Um, they're helpful, they're beneficial. Um, for the community, for the kids, for everything, the level of the school district um, and our determination. So. so, Mr. Chair, on behalf of a grateful school district, we certainly thank the, the local Rotary and their representatives that are here tonight. Uh, they have made a difference, and it's been a great partnership and collaboration through five years, and hopefully it will continue on down the road. So Absolutely. thank you very much. Thank you. Did anyone like to? Matthew, would you? <laughs> if, you, if you'd like to, you, sure, you're well, more I, than welcome I, I to have say a few I, syllables. If I may introduce who's here tonight. What quiet, yeah, um, come on down. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, my name is Matthew Bruce. I'm the current and presiding president of the local club, Middleboro. Um, and who we have tonight is a past president, Sue Okalita. Uh, we have Willie Dufilly, who you might recognize from town. Uh, we have Bob Sekay who you also might recognize from town. 
uh, business owner. And not to miss my wife, lovely wife, Emma, and my son, Will. Awesome. And uh, I want to also thank you. It's been a, a great several years doing this program. Uh, the Rotary Club is, we have various charitable events throughout the year to try to raise funds uh, for the REAP program, uh, one of which is the television auction you probably have seen advertised. And that's been a great success for the club. Uh, and we're always looking for new and creative ways of raising funds to expand the program. Uh, we would like to see it expanded um, because we have seen through the great work of Derek Thompson, he's been extraordinary uh, right, from the, right from the beginning. Uh, when we first proposed this program, you came right up to me uh, that day uh, initially and you've championed the program ever since, so thank you for that. But uh, we, we really would like to see this uh, continue and uh, through the endeavor and the work of all these great Rotarians. So, uh, if I may, I, yeah. I remember you coming here, I was sitting on this board when you first came here to present this and it was gonna be us, we're just gonna try it first, see what happens. Yes, yes. And it started out as a small little idea and it's grown into what it is today. And we're yeah. seeing, we're seeing the, this huge benefit at this point uh, for the work that you guys do beyond everything else you do outside of this, um, what you do for our students, what you do for our community, and, and I'm thankful because I see you more than a few times throughout the year. Which for, is, yeah, different um, venues. Different, different venues, <laughs> and I just think it's wonderful um, what you guys do and what Thank you, you do in your other life. I, I, I see you at the places as well, so yeah. I see everyone, um, but I remember how excited I was when Willie mentioned it to me and said, wait till you see what's coming, and then you came in and presented it five years ago. It just seems like yesterday. So I'm just so happy that we're able to continue this. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. And we're always uh, certainly looking for Rotarians. So uh, <laughs> anyone that would like to join our club, it's a very dynamic club, great group of people. Uh, we meet, currently we're meeting on Wednesday evenings uh, at the local fireside restaurant at 6 p.m. So all are welcome. Thank so, you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. So I'm going to step back on the agenda and I'm going to turn it over to Owen for a student report. Mr. Chair, can you give me a picture? Sure. A picture? Sure. Before you go slow, can we get a picture? Is that possible for the uh, local newspaper? Sure. Give a little publicity. Where should we go? Should we go up on the stage? Oh, over there. No problem. Uh, the beginning of the school year is right around the corner and students are getting ready for the new year. Uh, Tuesday and yesterday served as the Start Strong Orientation Days for the class of 2022. The class was introduced to their first energizers toward the Middleborough High School, uh, got their schedules and bonded as a class over roller skating. Over 160 of the 200 students attended the program for the largest attendance ever. In addition, we had over 140 orientation leaders from the sophomore, junior, and senior classes. Uh, all in all, this was a great success, um, and I'm looking forward to the, the new year with the class of 2022. The fall sports season has started up, and teams are gearing up for their first games. We hope to replicate the successes of last fall season and to see many fellow Sachems in the stands. And I, I just came from the student council's first MASC. Uh, which is the state uh, program, and NASC, which is the national program, idea sharing meeting. Uh, students who were delegates at these conferences came to the school, ate some pizza, and shared ideas that they wanted to implement in the coming year. 
I saw a lot of fresh ideas that have made me even more excited for the, the coming year. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for all? Oh, and we know you start your senior year this year, and we appreciate uh, your time spent, and we look forward to spending your senior year with you here on the board. So thank you. Um, I did jump over public comment. Did anyone wish to make any comment not on tonight's agenda? Seeing no one, I'll move on. Um, any report from school committee members? Mr. Oh. Stevens. So I, my daughter is a freshman this year, and she attended the Start Strong. And I got to say, it's just so impressive. We drove up, and they were all... The upperclassmen were lining the street, lining the sidewalks. She was a little intimidated. She's like, what's going on? But, you know, it's so impressive that so many of uh, the students gave up, you know, significant portion of time to prepare and, and do their, you know, 140 kids given their time is really impressive. So kudos to those. The great program. She feels a lot better. She's got her uh, device already working, you know, so that's good to see. So very um, happy with that program. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments? Um, I do want to make one um, thing to the board that last night the superintendent and I, along with um, Adam Pelletier, attended the cable meeting. We had a very productive meeting um, with the members of the cable uh, committee. Um, we outlined some of the, um, if, there were ch if there were to be changes, and this was a proposal that was going up, that um, how it would affect us and how we would need uh, especially as we talked about before, we have some contractual language that we need to look at and everything like that. And so um, I spoke to the chair and I emailed the chair th this morning again. And he said again that it was a proposed potential. It wasn't anything in stone. And if there was to be anything moving forward, they were going to spend some time on it for a couple of months. And then they may get back or ask either myself or me, me to send over a little subcommittee to work with them and have some conversations, but I didn't want people to know about that. Did you have anything you wanted to add? I would say that Dr. Gates and Sean Siciliano yes, also attended you. the meeting, um, and the concerns were around a proposal that we sort of thought was, was uh, something that we were going to vote on last night, I think, was my impression. Um, it became clear from the chair of the Permanent Cable Committee that this was something they were just uh, pondering as a possibility, and um, we would have input in that uh, in that process and they also pointed out the fact that ultimately any of these changes in the in the uh, policies would have to be approved also by the selectmen at some point uh, in the near future uh, so uh, I'm glad we were able to go I'm glad we were able to support Mr. Pelletier uh, in his thoughts with regarding educational television and the devotion and the work he's done for it and um, I, I look towards the future of this agreement and making sure that we, we have that delineation between public, government, and educational television in this community. Thank I should you. also mention, too, as we discussed at our last meeting, uh, there's a series of focus groups coming up for cables. Yes. Um, the sign-up for that is actually due next week, I believe. And so you can go to the town website. You can go to the cable um, website if you could sign up if you want to. I've already signed up for the focus group on the educational channel. Um, so I would ask anybody who's interested to please do that. Chair, yes. That educational one, it will be uh, Thursday, September 6th from 3.30 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. at the Selectman's Meeting Room in Nickers uh, 10 Nickerson Avenue in Middleborough. Um, I believe that if you couldn't attend that one, if you go to another one, they will still take your input because yep. the day before they have, uh, they have one at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and then one at 6 o'clock at night on the, on the Wednesday the 5th. So uh, the educational one specifically is uh, the sixth, Thursday the 6th from 3.30 to 5.30. Uh, but uh, it, be heard. Um, I mean, you're paying a tax right now on your cable TV portion of your bills, um, and that goes to a, a fund that helps fund this this uh, piece but also um, what you want to see on the educational channel is your chance to say what you'd like to see on it yeah. and I like seeing what we see on it right now yes mr. Givenoni it's about peg access which is uh, the access to our public channels and one is there's public there's educational and there's governmental so each of those three categories will be vetted through the community uh, in anticipation of going to negotiations with both Verizon and Comcast for future contracts and future relationships with the uh, with the town. And Mr. Chair, 
currently the tax is two I'm sorry the fee is two, the peg fee is two and a half percent of your cable TV bill yeah so not that you may you know, not your whole bundle right. but just the cable cable TV part so if you bundle your stuff it is broken out in pieces you can look it up and it's usually in the bottom Correct. section of fees where there's like where did all this money go um, but you have your 911 fees it's in peg access so for someone I pay I pay quite a bit annually on that that fee for what I have in my household um, I'd like to have a say in it um, any other comments by board members I do want to mention one thing that I think is important and I don't think we can emphasize it enough is September 4th is primary election day the schools will not be open if that's the Tuesday after um, for students it will not yes. be open for students it's the Tuesday after Labor Day it's sort of an unusual circumstance for us um, but again the school day day starts when the school year starts Wednesday the 5th not Tuesday the 4th so yep. and for kindergarten it's the day after and for preschool it's the Monday following and then uh, Mr. Catino notified the superintendent and I that he wouldn't be here tonight, so there's no MEA report. Yeah, no, he could not make it tonight, unfortunately, uh, but I would like to report out to the committee that he, uh, myself, uh, and Mrs. Lazarovich, Kate Lazarovich, the vice president of the association, did have a chance to sit down and have a kickoff meeting for the year um, to talk about uh, some things that we can do together. Um, they also uh, noted to the committee uh, that they would like to put uh, an issue in abeyance yep. uh, for the period of time until such time as negotiations have been completed in the following the, during this year so that matter that we had spoken of uh, has been placed in abeyance uh, for the period of time that uh, being everything I'll turn it over to the superintendent for his report thank you very much uh, I would like to invite down to the podium uh, a couple of ladies from the community who've done a great deal of work with the SHARP program and they'd like to come down and, and say hello and give us a, a little report. I'd like to ask Joanne Babin and Sedalia Pina to come on down. And I believe they also have some audio visuals. Oh, some friends. and some friends. <laughs> and displays. <laughs> So welcome ladies this is the sharp program it's a two-week program in the summer that's been uh, I can't tell you the number of years but I'm guessing it's about 20 26, years. 26. 26 so years. Joanne why don't you take it away All right. so, let's see. this is the 26th year of sharp um, this year we had 114 kids um, come and participate and we had some scholarships from Mary Kay Good and um, MECC and HBB sponsor some kids so nice. if they couldn't go they were able to go um, I worked with Meg Quirk to get the kids um, HBB had given us five scholarships we only ended up using four of them so I refunded them back hopefully it's used the next year <laughs> um, of the 114 kids 103 were for uh, grades one through six and then we had I opened last year a steam program um, that Sedalia has run and she had 11 uh, students that were grades six to eighth um, I opened it up because when the kids finished shop they were all they were sad they were like oh well, now what are we gonna do with that kid <laughs> kids so I was like well we'll try it and I tried it last year we had 12 <coughs> students last year 11 this year um, let's see so at the, um, it's, at the shop, we had um, a wake-up call. We had Channel 5 News come in, uh, not come in. We videotaped it, and then we sent it to the news. So the kids were on the news. They were very excited about being on, on television. And then I also had a woman, her name is Laura Zawit, come in, and she um, talked about, it's called Re uh, Regan's Act of Kindness, and they paint rocks. It's for a little girl. She had been hit by a car, so her family wants to do um, kind things so this is the t-shirt says be kind so the kids after the program I had them stay after and I had collected rocks for weeks before and they came and just painted kindness rocks and they took them home and they're supposed to be around town so Good. if you see a rock it could be one that they painted um, and then since Sedalia was going to talk more about the steam part of it this year since shop's been around forever <laughs> okay is this is this the one for you well, thank you for um, 
Superintendent Lynch and Chair Young and the rest of the members. Thank you for allowing us to um, be on your agenda tonight and thank you for um, letting us share SHARP and especially STEAM, which I am um, passionate about. Um, so my objectives, and I have, um, I'm sorry, Corinne and Joanna with us today, two of the students that were in my class. Um, so my objectives for SHARP um, with students is to introduce STEM technology, or in, in, in this case, STEAM, because I have to add art, um, the ideas and concepts, um, and ask the students through experiential learning, um, collaboration, and working through the creative process to find ways to be problem solvers. Um, my classes are very uh, loosely structured, I guess, um, because for me it's more important that the students lead the exploration. Um, so it's fluid, it can change, it can move. Um, what I love most about uh, what I do in STEAM is if uh, students love something that they've been introduced to, they work at it for days. And sometimes something's not so popular and we put it away and move on. Um, so my, my objectives are to engage students. Um, I try to build about 10 lesson plans for the eight days. And um, sometimes those lesson plans are visited every day. Uh, for example, uh, last year, a very simple potential kinetic energy uh, lesson turned into um, must do every day. Right, girls? Um, Joanna was in my class last year, and we were making kinetic stars for two weeks. And they loved it so much that they turned the kinetic star idea into kinetic snakes. And um, they each got a little bundle of craft sticks so that they could explore some more at home. Um, and the goals that I have when I teach um, STEAM is really to build curiosity with students so that their brains start thinking about STEAM all the time, and STEM um, at the basic. Um, and one of the uh, things that I love most about is then when they take those ideas and make them their own. Um, and one of my favorite things as, a, as an educator, generally speaking, is when they take ideas that they learn in the classroom and then I hear them or find out that they're doing them at home or talking about them or um, they're exploring other ways to problem solve using some of those ideas that we visited during the STEAM class. I think that makes for a successful student and I can't be more proud as an educator when that happens. So this year um, in STEAM, um, I'll just go through really quickly some of the stuff that we, we did. Um, we hatched quail. We talked about um, life science and reproduction and we um, incubated quail eggs and they took all eight days, the two weeks, because our classroom was very cold and that messes with the um, incubation of the eggs, which was unexpected. Our class sometimes was 58 degrees, so that does not make for a very happy um, incubation. So the quails finally did hatch. They hatched the last day, and um, some of the students got to take those little chicks home with them, and they're raising them today. Um, so that was fun. Um, uh, for engineering, we um, talked about egg strength in a chicken egg. So as fragile as an egg is, it's also super crazy strong at the ends. And we challenged the kids to try to break an egg just using two fingers, and they couldn't do it. And I think that surprised a lot of them. Um, we took that lesson, and we talked about brain injury and concussion. And we used an egg to simulate what happens in your head. So the kids were challenged with building a helmet out of recycled materials. They had um, to work with some parameters, which was um, the helmet had to be removable, just like a helmet you would in, use, use in sports um, or on a bike or motorcycle. Um, and they had to find ways to protect their brain egg. Um, 
and we had three tests that they had to um, get through. If they passed the first test, they moved on to the second test. And it was to try to simulate the best that we could in that type of um, class setting, um, like an accident or a um, injury by impact. Um, and I think three, three kids passed the test, all three tests, and we, they were intense. We dropped heavy textbooks on the eggs, we threw them against a tree outside. So, um, and then we talked about uh, the lobes of the brain and how that would affect the eggs when they cracked in relation to what would happen to your brain if you got into an accident or a concussion. Um, we brought back geocaching from last year's um, STEAM, which was very popular. We weren't very successful with our geocaching trip this year because we couldn't find the caches. Um, geocaching, unfortunately, is as successful as the respect for the boxes out in the woods, and sometimes if they're taken or misplaced, then... Um, but we had a chance to talk about um, GIS and GPS and coordinates, and um, last year our students created a box that we built and hid in the woods, registered with the geocaching website. It was taken, unfortunately, but we are, as a group, decided that we were gonna replace the box and try again. Um, so that was fun, it was a fun day, and we got a chance to get some exercise. Um, we had a forensic science unit where we talked about fingerprinting and the science behind using fingerprint technology to solve a crime. We had a special guest, a Middleborough High School alum, um, Mr. Adam Hanna, who is also in, had interned with the police department, and he shared his knowledge about not just fingerprinting and forensic science, but he was able to share with the students his um, choice in major as he goes off to Westfield State as a criminal science student, um, which really excited some of the kids in the classroom as they were sort of the questioning and I had questions for him about that type of study. Um, let's see, we also did fun things like uh, free art day. We built with um, recycled materials. Um, we had big buildings going. Uh, we did a tie-dye unit for chemistry art. Um, which was sort of a fun, lighter day. And then we had a day of technology, or a couple of days, three or four days, I guess, um, where we introduced um, virtual reality using smartphone technology. So there's a really cool app that's called um, Google Cardboard. Uh, there's many apps, but I introduced Google Cardboard to the students. And they got a chance to not only see what virtual reality uh, technology looks like, but they got a chance to um, keep and take home a um, Google Glass, that's what it's called. Um, Makey Makeys, this is really powerful, fun um, tool. I call it a tool because there, it's just limitless to what you could do. Um, that was borrowed from a teacher friend who I will talk about. Um, her classroom had 12 of them or 18 of them, so each student got a chance as we borrowed those boxes. We bought this for the SHARP program, um, so we'll keep that in-house for SHARP. But we got to borrow these eight Makey Makeys, so kids um, all got a chance to try it. And it's built on the concept of circuitry. And the kids got to, um, so circuitry connected to the Makey Makey device allows, um, with HTML language and coding, to replace objects for the keyboard. So keys on the keyboard um, uh, functions are replaced with bananas or uh, dishes of water or Play-Doh. Um, I introduced the concept and then allowed the kids to choose what was conductive to make that circuit close. Uh, and they learned um, that water is conductive. They even learned that using graphite when the Makey Makey was connected to a line of graphite, it would um, mimic a keyboard stroke. Um, that was a fun day. And this tool is uh, like I said, limitless. That's um, from the Makey Wakey website. Um, 
And we did green screen technology um, using the software Doink and some Apple iPads that I again borrowed. We uh, created commercials, video, photos, and manipulated backgrounds. And um, maybe Corinne can come up and show us. We have a video to share, too. Welcome. Um, green screen was my favorite thing that we did in Steam. We took a lot of pictures and everybody got to choose what background they wanted. We did some at Disney World. Me and a few of our other students um, made a news video pretending to be news reporters and we were reporting on what we did in Steam. Welcome back to Middleborough News. Today we're filming from Steam at Middleborough Sharp Program. Today they're working on Kinetic Stars. Kinetic Stars is weaving popsicle sticks back and forth to make something to throw it at a wall. We also have been doing VR. Oh, here oh. comes one of our VR people now. Very lost. Oh. Please. I should fly. Uh, well, we Whoa! are doing something really fun. And in 20 minutes, we will be filming, it'll be brought to you by Ryan, filming the kinetic stars getting thrown at the wall. There might be a kinetic explosion. It'll be live. Have a nice day. What? Goodbye. <laughs> to Middleborough News. Today, we are in the steam room at Middleborough Sharp Program, and Ryan Fahey will be telling you what the kids have been doing live today. Today, the kids are making yeah. kinetic stars. Here's Gregory, who are doing kinetic star stars. No. There has been a kinetic explosion, but luckily, our breads are protected by the compass, but the frails don't have. We also were geocaching looking for ocean grass in our tie-dye shirts. This live stream was brought to you by Do Inc. Green Screen Technology. This is Corinne Horseman and Joanna Perilla signing, signing out. out. Thank you, Emma Pina Doherty, for filming this. <laughs> Obviously, we've learned that Middleborough's team has had a fun and educational week at the Middleborough Sharp Program. We also learned that they've been reading a book called Seed Folks and they've learned to do community service and ignore stereotypes. They also learned about an ocean trash unit that Joanna will talk about. Hi guys! Oh. Oh, hi. How long does it take for a plastic bottle or a plastic bag to break down? Well, your average plastic bottle or plastic bag could take up to a thousand years to disintegrate. And there are much better ways to pack your snack and it's very easy to find a better use and a better way to pack your snack for the environment. I think I'm going to buy something better than a plastic bag. <laughs> I hope that you guys sign up for Steam next year because we'll, do it, we'll be doing much more fun stuff. Have a nice day, signing off. The green screen was definitely everybody's favorite. We used it every day that we were in Steam, and um, we made lots of cool videos and photos using that. And I will definitely sign up for Steam again next year and the year after that. Awesome. That's great. Thank you, Corinne. Thank you. Thank you, Corinne. Nice Okay, um, so lastly, I think um, the only thing left to talk about is probably my two favorite um, activities or lessons that we did. Um, ocean trash was mentioned in um, the STEAM video, 
And um, so the ocean trash lesson that we had planned was really um, inspired by a young person by the name of Boyan Slot. He um, started very young, probably um, you know middle school age. Um, he was bothered by what was happening in the Pacific Ocean, which we um, call the Great Pacific Ocean Patch of Trash, Garbage Patch. Um, there are two subtropical convection zones that are, for lack of a better word, swirling trash into big piles. Um, and he's working to try to clean that up. So he's created with um, all of the steam that you could possibly imagine, uh, large inflatable booms that will pull across the ocean to collect some of that garbage. Um, so we talked to the students about better ways to handle trash, better ways to um, perhaps not even introduce plastic. So the kids got a chance to look up research how long some of this trash lasts in the ocean, and they created that poster. Joanna, do you want to jump up there and talk about it? Sure. OK. Um, I, you just talk loud enough, and I'll help you hold it. OK. So I essentially like led the ocean trash poster and we had everyone pick one item of trash to essentially research and they had to tell us how long it takes to disintegrate in a regular landfill and then how long it takes in the ocean. And um, one of the most surprising ones that I learned was actually bubble wrap and it has not been invented long enough to know how long it disintegrates. So that one I found very surprising. And then there were a couple very interesting photos there. Like there's one of a turtle and there is a soda holder attached to it and it couldn't grow through it. So it grew around it. And I thought that was kind of scary because animals shouldn't be treated like that. So I thought it was very interesting to learn what we as humans are doing to our environment and that the world survived a whole lot better without us. So, yeah. Thank you very nice. <clears throat> So the students were surprised. I think um, for the most part, a lot of that plastic, uh, especially the newer plastic, just, just not enough data to, um, to tell us how long that would take to disintegrate in the ocean. Um, but for example, a Ziploc bag is 400 to 600 years. And Ziploc bags are one of those um, really easy choices that you can make. It's a single-use plastic. You use it once and you throw it out. And there's so many other ways to package a sandwich. Um, so the poster was um, designed to introduce technology that Boyan Slat is trying to clean up the ocean with, but it was also a, um, a project that we hope to bring awareness um, to students. The poster is gonna be installed somewhere here at Nichols for a few weeks, and then I've um, um, been asked to share it at the Bourne Visitor Center for the canal where we see trash all the time near the ocean. Um, the last favorite thing of mine, probably not a very obvious steam or STEM concept, um, this is a book called Seed Folks by Paul Fleshman. Um, it's one of my favorite teaching tools. And um, the book is so powerful and so impacting that I feel like every time I'm with a group of students, I need to share it. Um, I was able to sneak it in and sort of justify the fact that it's STEM related because it's about gardening. Um, and the, the concept of the story is a group of people get together and clean up a parking lot full of trash in a city in Ohio and turn it into a garden. 
But the book really is about um, community, it's about cultural differences, and I think it's a celebration of people coming together, sharing their culture and diversity, and breaking down stereotypes. And with the climate that we have in the media right now, I felt like it was important to share with students, and I try to every time I get a chance. Um, it also tells a story that we have more than our single story to share, and we have many things, um, talents that are multifaceted that we can provide and give to the community. Um, and I reminded the kids every day, there's um, content in the book that um, characters have to rise to the occasion and be bold and stick up for people that don't have voices to advocate for themselves. So it's really a book about um, making changes and um, doing great things for other people. So we read um, this book probably every morning as sort of a warm up and then we got through most of the book so the kids really got invested in the characters and each character weaves their story into the next character and then the students got each a copy of the book to take home and share with their families and hopefully they finish reading the book. Um, so that's what we did this year. Wow. Um, How yeah. long's the program? Eight Six days. months? <laughs> wow. It's only eight days. eight days. Yeah, but the kids in my STEAM class are with me for the whole time. They don't switch classes. So they have snack with me together, and we all kind of hang out for three hours and really get to know each other. Um, next year, I have tons of new ideas. This head is full of them. Um, we're going to tackle earth projections and global model making. Hopefully we can do plaster casting if I have students brave enough to put plaster on their face. Um, I'd love to do a unit about fabrication. Um, we're gonna do some more GIS and GPS with mapping. We're gonna actually map our footsteps and create a map of Middleborough or parts of Middleborough. Um, food science with spherification. Nature Trail discovery boxes I would love to build for the Pratt Farm. Um, so that's a nice community project. And I have an expert that's willing to come in and talk to us about honeybees. Wow. Um, and one more community project that, it's not really a sharp lesson or STEAM lesson, but maybe sharp could get um, all of the students involved in can collecting for Oak Point. Uh, my son was able to take advantage of a scholarship that he was offered this year because of cans, um, which I think is just remarkable. And we're so grateful to the friends at Oak Point. So it's our way of giving back. Um, looking ahead five years from now, um, I would love to be able to expand STEAM. Joanne and I have talked about doing that um, uh, and do more for next year. Um, this year, I was able to borrow this technology, um, the Makey Makeys, the green screen, the iPads. It's expensive equipment. We don't have it here in Middleborough, but um, Toby Eugenio is a STEAM teacher at a small school in New Bedford, and the OSS school is able to have that equipment. So I think somehow Middleborough can find a way to do it. Um, I'm pretty good at writing a grant. So I'm willing to do that. Um, I think teachers are very good at borrowing and, and asking for gifts. Yeah. So we'll find a way if I have the support of school committee and um, parents to maybe pull some resources together and have um, all of this equipment in-house with Sharp so that more students can take advantage of using the type of technology that our students got to this year in STEAM. Um, I guess that's probably just about it. Um, one other thing I have um, as an idea for maybe next year, if we can pull it off, is to create a Sharp Maker Studio. So that would be offered just like we did the Rocks project this year, like a couple of hours one day after school. And a maker studio is very easy to put together. I mean, it's cool if we can have this technology to add to it. Um, but a maker studio can just be uh, parents saving recycled materials and giving students a chance to glue, build, construct, and make. Um, so that's sort of outward dreams. Um, I think it's so important to emphasize STEAM at 
as young as an age as we can and start early. Um, it's everywhere and STEAM careers are everywhere. So the sooner as we get students to start thinking about STEAM, um, the more exposure they have, um, then they start building those skills with STEAM activities in the classroom. Um, and maybe future leaders and innovators will follow. Well, thank you all very much for coming tonight, presenting the SHARP program. Certainly very interesting. I, I noticed uh, Mr. Oakley over there is <laughs> chopping at the bit to talk about some of the things he's doing in town to bring these innovative uh, materials into the town and set up a lab. And I would also mention that in the vision statement for the new high school and in the building of the new high school, there is a, 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 an innovation center in the school that includes a steam wing, uh, maker space, a fabrication lab, uh, and that is the future. And we certainly have the, the uh, robot, robotics here at the Nichols Middle School, and there's a lot of opportunities within the school system, but certainly encourage any, any grant writing you might do uh, that would, would help the system. That's no doubt about it. So any of the uh, committee have any questions for our guests? Mr. Chair, uh, uh, when is the next time that you'll be running this program? We do it every summer. Okay. Uh, summer, the two weeks after the 4th of July. Okay. Well, um, by next summer, uh, I'd be happy to let you guys borrow some 3D printers um, if, if you're into that idea. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I do want to ask one thing. Please. Yes. And it re regards the, the poster. And I think putting up the poster here is great. And I know you talked about bringing it to... but. I also think it'd be great if you brought it back at the end of the year, because I think when kids are determining whether or not to go to Sharp, to have these things in the school at that time, so they rem sort of remember, hey, this yeah. is what the kids did, and, and were able to do. I think that would be a big help, and and so if we could bring that stuff back, and maybe even put some of the videos that you made on our website, like That'd towards the end of the year, so that people mm. can see what sharp is and know yeah. what sharp's about i think that would be fantastic too yeah. okay consider it done it's right. like yeah. this year she had three repeat kittens and the rest of them were new yeah. yeah i mean that's it's a great opportunity and i think as these young ladies talk it up yeah. uh it certainly is something that will become more popular certainly and uh Sounds like your room was kind of cold, so we can talk to the facilities about that. But Ms. <laughs> Mrs. Babin insists on I like the air she likes the air conditioning, so that's why she likes to have it in the school. But you know, if to be successful, the steam program has to be in Brooklyn. Then I'm just kidding, Ms. Babin. Okay. But thank you very much, and thank you, ladies, young ladies, especially. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's important that you are able to display and talk about what you've done. So it's great. So, Mr. Chair, again, with tonight's theme being sort of a summary of the summer, if you will, I'd like to invite Carolyn Lyons, our PPS director, and Patricia Ferretti, who is our extended school year program director, down to the table to talk about the extended school year program. As you know, we have what's called an ESY, or extended school year program, that basically gives us an opportunity to extend the learning through the summer, especially with those child, children with special needs. and. Uh, Carolyn and Trish are here to talk about it, so I'll let you have a seat, and, and I would certainly welcome you, ladies. Uh, Trish, if you could, you could turn that mic around, and the one that, no, the one that's on the speaker there, and there you go. So you don't you're not passing the mic back and forth. Awesome. Okay. Well, welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Yeah. Superintendent Lynch. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is give you a little brief overview of what extended school year services are and then talk a little bit about the changes that we've made with this program over the last two years. Um, and then I'm going to let uh, Mrs. Ferretti talk about her experience with the program. So extended school year services are additional services that the district must provide for students when a child's team determines on an individual basis that they need those services to receive a free and appropriate public education. That occurs at a yearly annual meeting. And the team reviews data and kind of looks at how the student has been uh, making progress. And they look at report cards and MCAS performance and progress notes, um, informal assessments. They look at kind of all areas, including social and emotional uh, growth, to determine whether or not a student is maintaining their current levels of, of performance. Um, when they have data to suggest that the students aren't and they are experiencing what's known as substantial regression of skills, then the student could qualify for these extended school year services. Um, in the grand scheme of percentage, it's not the majority of special ed students. We're right around 600 here in Middleborough. Um, and the percentage is 
not high. Um, I'll let you know Trisha talk a little bit more about the specifics of numbers of students. Um, so in any event, while all students experience some form of regression, regression at the beginning of the school year, we already account for that. The curriculum spirals back in those early months, but for a small percentage of students, they're not able to recoup those lost skills within that set period of time. So we ultimately uh, solicit and collect data after the summer um, at those natural breaks in the school year, so after December, after February, and then after April. And we look, did this student regain those skills as they come back? Did it take longer? How much longer? And what discrete skills were lost? Um, so that's kind of what goes into tabulating who gets extended school year services. Um, so like any other special specialized program, Middleborough offers its own uh, extended school year program. It uh, is four days a week, four full days a week, over six weeks over the summer. We have selected to stagger it kind of right in the middle, so there's a bit of a break after school gets out, although depending on when we get out in June. Hmm. And then um, there's a small break this, this period of time, actually. It just ended on last Friday. Uh, last yeah, last Thursday. Friday, last Thursday. It doesn't run on Friday. Um, so in terms of the program, it is a full academic program from nine to one. It includes both breakfast and lunch, with thanks to Rebecca Bagnell, who's able to secure that for us. Uh, a full complement of related services, which includes occupational therapy, speech, physical therapy. Um, we have a full-time school adjustment counselor devoted to the program, full-time nurse, and um, there's even BCBA oversight, our board certified behavior analyst, to help us out with behavior plans um, and anything else that might kind of crop up. Our program is divided into full programs, so there are children who attend that. And then uh, we have tutoring program as well, which is for students who experience that regression of skills in discrete areas like ELA-based skills, reading, written language, or math, or in some cases, both. Um, so we run kind of two separate programs. Mm -hmm. We have made changes to remain competitive because unsurprisingly, like many programs, if we aren't offering a program that is um, appropriate, then families will solicit that program elsewhere and it costs the district more. So it has behooved us all to um, remain competitive and current. So what I wanted to talk to you was a little bit about what I mean by that and give you a little bit of the history of ESY in Middleborough. So the, the program's been in existence for years because this is not a new obligation. So that's kind of been around for a long time. And for a long time, the program was at the Memorial Early Childhood Center. And it involved use of the town pool. And it kind of functioned that way for a long period of time. Several years ago, a couple of directors ago, the program was moved to here at the John T. Nichols School. And the reason it was moved was to um, increase the academic fo focus of the program. The tricky part being, you know, it is a summer program. So you, you have to strike that really fine balance between keeping these kids engaged and happy because it is summer and they fully understand that their friends are outside and you know playing, doing anything else, um, and being rigorous enough to, to prevent that regression of skills. So you, know, you, you can't go too far into the rigor and retain that excitement. And you don't want to go too far into the recreation because now you're not running an academic program. So it's kind of this delicate balance. So two summers ago, um, I instituted a series of changes. And the first thing I did was move it back to the Memorial Early Childhood Center. And um, I didn't do it in a vacuum. I vetted it through my MPAC, my Middleborough Parent Advisory Council, uh, special ed administration, superintendent, um, and people who had previously worked in the program. So uh, I felt confident in moving it back to the MEC because of its location, primarily. It's centrally located near community-based resources. That costs very little, if, if anything, for us to go visit. It gives kids access to things like the police station, the fire department, well, the police station's moving now, but back when it, it was moved, it was there. Uh, the post office, um, there's a town hall. There, I mean, everything is in the center of town, and Mech's actually in the heart of that area. Uh, the equipment and play structures were actually more appropriate at the Mech than here at the Nichols. That was something that we experienced in the move here. Um, while it suited our secondary students, the overwhelming majority of our population is actually younger. So, and it became quite an issue with little, little legs using the bathrooms here and everything else. It's easier to be a larger person in a smaller setting than a too small person in a larger setting. 
Um, so we had that experience, and uh, staffing had become an issue. It was actually really hard to staff the program. There wasn't, there was not uh, overflowing interest when it was here at the Nichols. Um, so the first thing I did was make that change. The next thing I did was break our pre-K session into two sessions. Right now our pre-K program runs in two sessions, AM session, PM session. With that not being broken out, ultimately it led to over-servicing, and more importantly, it didn't mimic what these kids were getting during the school year. So we've broken it into two sessions now. Um, and lastly, I hired an ESY coordinator who's sitting with me today. Um, previously, this program had been filled by sitting special education administrators. Um, and what I'll say is that when I solicited a new coordinator, I was looking for someone that could bring fresh eyes to the program. And you know, Ms. Tricia Ferretti is a sitting pre-K teacher here in our district. She has a ton of experience with early childhood. Um, she is fresh to administration here in Middleborough, but not fresh to administration or the skills that go along with it. And she has an energy that um, I think if you talk to anybody in town, you'll get to hear about. And an ownership of this program that I can see is going to build a, a big future for the program. Um, I truly can't say enough about Mrs. Freddie sitting here to my left, and I know she'd get embarrassed if I went on and on, but. But truly, I need to, because the feedback that I heard right away with this particular change was stunning. Um, as you can imagine, I'm used to hearing uh, a whole host of things from the community when they're happy, when they're not happy, and I've yet to hear negative feedback on Mrs. Freddie. I've had parents come up to me, parents hug me because they're so excited about these changes. I have parents who are sitting employees who have gone out of their way to tell me what the impact of Mrs. Freddie has meant to the program. Um, so I feel really confident in this particular role. I, I've worked alongside her. I've seen the hours she puts in, the individualization, um, and the drive to improve the program. So I feel like we're really lucky with that particular facet. Um, we saw immediate improvement. Um, we had staffing that, I, for the first time, we had too many applicants, not too little applicants. Um, and we had parent and student satisfaction. So this year, we instituted some more changes. Um, I designated a special education coordinator, in this case it was Ms. Laura Mansfield from the Berkland, to assist in the planning and preparation of this program over a year-long calendar. And she was instrumental in kind of breaking down each facet of this program, right down to the groupings, who were we putting kids with, who was teaching, who were we using for ESPs. Um, and by breaking it into smaller parts, it allowed us to really kind of dissect what we were doing. It led to a major overhaul of all the paperwork associated with the ESY program. We'd experienced some cumbersome paperwork, registration, we weren't getting emergency contacts, that sort of thing. So by spending some time reviewing that, um, it's been much more streamlined. Paperwork's been returned, and we feel more confident that, that we're ensuring the utmost in safety um, with our most precious assets. We also reviewed and updated our peer model process. So we run this program for special ed students, but we also, we also provide model peers so that kids can model or have models of what we're hoping to see. Uh, these are current students here in our district, and they attend. And by taking a closer look at what exactly are we looking for in a model student and talking to our staff about it, it brought us to greater clarity and I think a higher quality of a peer model. And then I, um, I, alongside with Ms. Mansfield, reviewed and changed the student intern process. We've long used our students, but I wasn't totally clear on what it was we were doing. So what we're doing now is that we're looking at upper class high school students right here in Middleborough. And we are able to um, kind of hire them to help in the classroom. This gives kids, in some examples, their first taste of education, and most of the applicants we took want to become teachers. So one, it's um, a great cost-saving mechanism to use some of our help, and for another, it exposes our kids to service to others and employment. So I'm gonna let Mrs. Freddy talk about one particular student. If you don't talk about him, I will come back and talk about him. Oh, yes. But uh, we had one particularly successful story about a sitting student who had struggles of his own in the last two years and honestly it's like hard to talk about it without tearing up because he was um, a model student intern. His attendance was fantastic. His rapport with the students 
was so good that when he left, we had students that were sad. Um, and to see that growth in that student and give that gift of service to others is something that it's very hard to quantify. You kind of have to just see it. So I'll let, uh, I'll let Trisha talk about that in a minute. Um, as a result, and unsurprisingly, uh, the resumes came pouring in. This year, we actually have now a competitive pool for who we're going to hire for this program. And um, I, we had to turn a lot of people away. And what that's doing is elevating the quality of what we're able to provide to our kids. It's exactly how it should be running. Um, we also had the addition of an office support staff, and I'll let Tricia talk about this, but what that meant is that for the first time, the coordinator didn't have to spend an inordinate amount of time answering the door and answering the telephone and doing, um, you know, more, you know, kind of um, front office work. She was able to be in the programs and really give that in the moment feedback to staff. I actually had sitting administrators who had popped through to kind of see call me and tell me that they saw such instructional leadership, they couldn't believe what they were seeing, and did she want to work full time um, in the administrative role? Oh. So, yeah, <laughs> it was funny. It's kind of funny. And of course I said no because she's a fabulous pre-K teacher. Um, the other thing we did was we opened up the high school schedule. We have high school students and post-grad students that participate in this program. and. As you know, I've come from this phenomenon of secondary education in my previous role here in the district. And I just didn't feel like it was appropriate for these kids to be sitting in a classroom four days a week when I know that what they're doing at the high school is extremely dynamic. So we parroted kind of some of that schedule. Um, these kids have access to Wellspring Farms, which is a partnership that we have uh, for, it's ultimately horse therapy. We have kids that go and ride and we have kids that go and work. So it's a vocational opportunity as well as a therapeutic opportunity. They um, actually opened up the Y to a small percentage of our students uh, this year. So these are students who accessed the Y during the school year and they were able to do it again during ESY. Uh, thank you to the YMCA for that. They're um, very generous with us. And the uh, vocational and volunteer experiences we expanded to the School on Wheels of Massachusetts in East Bridgewater. Um, our kids got to go and help others. The School on Wheels is a nonprofit I encourage you to look up and read about. They help students touched by homelessness. They have a backpack program. They have a tutoring program that's all free. Uh, they offer that tutoring at the Conway House here in Middleborough. They're always looking for tutors if anybody's interested. Um, but to have our kids be able to give back um, at this point in their career doesn't just teach them vocational skills, but it teaches them how to be good citizens, which is completely in line with, you know, our strategic plan for continuous improvement and our mission as, a, as an organization. They also engage in the community-based field trips, um, like the fire department, that sort of thing, that we'd lost when we moved to the Nichols, because every time you run a bus, there is an additional cost, and there's still people driving that bus and um, maintenance of that bus. So we were able to do some more of that um, through this program. So I'll turn it over to Tricia, but I'll just talk briefly about some of the markers of success that I saw. I had coordinators present um, periodically throughout the, the year-round special ed coordinators, so they could check in, and the feedback I got was just overwhelmingly positive. I've yet to hear negative feedback from these changes, so I'm really proud of that. Um, I was there for opening day, and I've been, <laughs> I've been at opening day every year, and I have to tell you, it always kind of stresses me out because there's a lot of new things happening all at once. And this year I wasn't stressed at all. It ran like a well-oiled machine. It looked like we'd been doing it for weeks. And on day one, that's not a small feat when you have all these small children and they all have to get to a new place with oftentimes new faces. Um, the teacher preparedness, you could feel. I met with the teachers before. Ms. Trisha had homemade Play-Doh for every single teacher in their little welcome packet with their supplies. I could see that they were confident and ready, and that translates to our kids. That, that consistency, that, and not for nothing, I knew most of the faces mm -hmm. um, because we selected sitting teachers. So not only am, are we bringing that consistency, but when you're bringing confident instruction, you're not worrying about that in the first days of the program. You're learning right off the bat. The student response was really positive. The attendance is going up for students in the program, um, and the parent feedback has just been truly um, something I didn't expect. And um, I'm excited for this to continue. And with that, I'll let Trisha tell you a little bit about some of the things that they did together. Yeah. Um, hi, 
welcome. I will, I will be brief because um, Carolyn has talked um, a good amount of the program. <laughs> no, that was good. That was good. Um, just, you know, just so you know, at the MEC this summer, there were 70 students who from age 3 to 22, and those were our full program. And that's what Carolyn talked about. You know, they are more of our most involved kids throughout the district. And um, we had about 35 tutor students. So throughout the day, we had probably 30 to 40 staff members, you know, our program, our full program, and our tutor students. Um, I think one of the highlights for me for the summer was because when kids have to go to school in the summer, sometimes it's hard if it's not like, oh, I'm going to a camp for the summer. There was such joy and such pleasure for them coming to school every single day. Carolyn talked about the attendance. Every single day, they're like, I will see you tomorrow. I will see you tomorrow. <laughs> and we had all of our kids, because I'm, I'm at the Early Childhood Center, I'm only with pre-K and K. So I got to have three to 22. and. My favorite times were, is, was in the cafeteria at lunchtime. And you're just watching this little community of, from our district that I've grown to love. You know, I'll be 11 years um, this September. And they're all interacting with each other. You have the high schoolers showing the kindergartner something on their tablet and just the friendships that they're making from the peer models. Um, so that was just, I think, for anyone you know, you want your kids in your community, um, especially who are struggling maybe a little bit more, um, to love what they're doing and to have a great summer. Um, I do think it's very important, Carolyn talked about the academics. Um, I am very strong on the academics. However, my philosophy in my classroom and even in the program is the social emotional well-being is as important as the academics. Because we all have to get along and if we don't get along, then you know, your academics can only do so much. So I think for me, that's always just kind of how I run my classroom and how I run, um, how I kind of ran the building. So it was definitely different being the leader, um, the boss lady, as some of them would joke <laughs> over the summer. Um, but it was a job that I thoroughly, thoroughly took on. Um, I, I don't even know what else to say. Oh, the intern. So one thing I talked to Carolyn about was our high school interns coming in. And because I was there last year, I was able to kind of see some new returning ones. And we did have um, one who was new this year. And I spent every day kind of going through all the classrooms. And on the first day, um, the student was telling, you know, the students that he himself um, what has been on an ed plan and for most of his life. So he could kind of, he was trying to kind of build that connection. He was a little insecure, but he kind of, the relationship that was built um, that I saw every single day arrived almost an hour early. And I finally said, well, you know, it doesn't start till nine o'clock, honey, you don't have to come. And he's like, nope. So every single day, he was there. Finally, I got him to 8.15. But he was up there, ready to go. And um, he did have to leave um, a few days early for a family vacation. And he was very emotional having to leave. And one of, um, what, he was in a middle school program. And there's a lot of emotions that go with our middle school programs. Um, you know, one of the students was very upset, wasn't getting on the bus. We had a little issue. And I kind of get on the bus, and I'm like, you know, are you OK? What's going on? He's like, I'm fine, I'm fine. And I was looking, and I was talking to his teacher. His intern left. And that sh it kind of showed the importance that they're all just bridging together. And I think just being able to be the coordinator. Um, I told Carolyn I'm already writing my letter of intent for next year. <laughs> So, um, so Absolutely. that's it. I just want to be brief, but it's an amazing program. I'm honored that I get to be a part of it and work alongside Carolyn. Well, please come. I mean, next summer we do have an open house, but come if you'd like to come at any point. It's a great time. It really is. It's a fun yes. summer. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Mr. O. Hi. Thank you very much. Sure. Sounds like a really awesome program. Um, I was wondering if you could explain to me um, 
briefly, I guess, um, how you well, um, how many times a year do you evaluate for kids that need to be in this program, and how do you end up approaching them about it? How does that whole oh, process work? Oh, the actual work? students? Yeah. Okay, so um, what well, happens at the team meeting, mm -hmm. for starters. So students who are 14 or older ideally are sitting at the table. Um, once you get to that age, you're part of the, the team process, and it's always been my philosophy and our department's philosophy that we want our kids as involved as possible because it does not work to plan for young adults in a vacuum and then tell them how it's going to be. They have to be there. In terms of how often do we solicit the data, the September data can be very difficult because oftentimes it's a new teacher. So you're not, you're not going to have that background knowledge of the learner, um, but what they do is they look at like summer assignments, for example, and how they're, these kids are approaching the curriculum. So what they're looking for is kind of who's lagging behind and how long does it take them to catch up. So that data point in September is a rather soft data point. Come January, it becomes a hard data point because now you've had the learners in front of you and you administer an assessment upon return and you're trying to solicit, okay, where are you on that and how long is it taking you to recoup? So that happens in January and then it happens again in February after the February break. So in terms of what particular assessments are used, it's going to differ level to level. It also depends on what you're looking at. For some kids, as I said, because for some kids it could be discrete, like how they're performing in uh, written language or reading or math. But for other kids, it's how they emotionally tackle that return. And if you look at behavior data and some of those graphs and when behavior spikes, you'll see that for some kids that break um, is very, very difficult and their behavior will actually spike before and after. So we'd look at behavior data as another, um, as another point. That's then discussed at the team meeting and it can't happen until the parent accepts the IEP. So for 14 and older, those kids are hopefully at the table and for anybody who's either not at the table or 14 and older and not at the table, um, we're having conversations with them through our counseling department or their special education teacher or their special education contact person. It's typically their special education teacher, but um, we are big fans of not sort of pushing kids into it. So we every now and again will, and, and there are kids where you offer it and the family for whatever reason will not accept that. It's up, it's up to them, you know, it's a consent driven process. So we have that kid say, I don't want to. In fact, one of the kids we stepped down this year mm -hmm. that I'm thinking of, yeah, we, changed um, we changed, he was a full program student that we moved to the tutoring track because he genuinely struggled with the concept of why he had to be in school mm -hmm. for another six weeks when everybody else didn't. So this year, you know, we, I had talked to his team early this year because we had that data from last summer and uh, we approached the family about doing tutoring and he was really happy to be there. Yeah, it was great. He totally came on different. his bike and that was like building the independence through the family. He would right. arrive on his bike, you know, hey, can I talk with you? Nope. I'm like, okay. <laughs> really wasn't in the mood. He waited for his tutoring and did it and, and left when he was, was independent and went home. So, yeah. So, does that answer your question in yep. terms of, okay. Yeah, thank okay. you very much. Great. Other questions? Well, we appreciate it. I know uh, from discussions in the past, we've had, like you just said, there's certain uh, parents or children who made the decision not to come for the summer. But it sounds like as you expand this program and do different things, it sort of changes its focus and maybe kids will think of it more like a camp, if you will, right. than, than a going to school for six weeks during the summer. Right, right. So I think that's good. Yeah. I think it's the, the emotion these ladies have for this program is palpable, and I think it's uh, it's certainly admirable. So thank you both very much for the thank work you, you do in the Thanks summer. For inviting me. Thank and, uh, you. And there's a lot of teachers that are, don't work in the summer. So Trish, for you to volunteer to work, not volunteer, but to work in the yeah, summer. No, definitely, and, and definitely. But uh, like put all the work into it. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> And to the committee to continue with my report, uh, continue with the theme, I'd invite Ryan Sylvia, our athletic director, up to the, to the table to discuss the program that he started this year. We just heard about a couple of programs that have been in place for a lot of years, um, some of them changing, obviously, through, through the time. Uh, and with Ryan, he has a summer athletic program that he just started this year um, that he'd like to just talk about, um, you know, the trials and tribulations and the successes and the things he plans on improving for next year. So welcome, Mr. Sylvia. Thank you, Superintendent Lynch. Thanks for inviting me tonight. And uh, also thank you to the school committee for having me here. Um, a lot of action this summer. 
good to hear uh, everything that's going on. But uh, we had a lot of action in the athletic department as well. Uh, we started, I shouldn't say, uh, we had a somewhat existing program. We had a strength and conditioning program and a basketball clinic that had run last year. Uh, probably around 75 students total that participated in that, mostly middle school in the basketball clinic uh, with some youth and then um, some high school students in the, in the strength and conditioning clinic. Uh, this year we expanded, we offered 16 different clinics uh, throughout the t entire eight weeks of the summer. Uh, out of those 16, 11 of them ran. Uh, we had 211 participants uh, within the district, mostly at the middle school level. Um, about 65 high school students that participated in the strength and conditioning or what we called sport performance training at the, at the uh, high school uh, gym. And uh, a small number of elementary school students uh, going all the way down to grade three uh, in some uh, youth basketball. Uh, we also offered swimming and diving. Um, so I won't go through every single clinic uh, that we offered, but uh, there were nine different activities. Some of the clinics repeated track and field ran twice, basketball ran twice. Um, so overall, it was, it was a really successful program. Uh, all of the clinics, uh, if you remember when I proposed it back in, uh, I think, early spring, uh, were led by the head coaches of our high school teams, and that was in an effort to uh, expose the, the younger students in Middleborough to our high school coaches and their expertise, and uh, you know, with the hope that they, they look forward to uh, competing on those teams in the future. Um, another aspect of the program was that we had high school students working towards their community service hours uh, that they're now re uh, required for graduation. Um, so we had a number of high school students uh, volunteer as kind of assistant coaches, uh, volunteer their time to help out, uh, especially with the larger clinics. The basketball clinic was uh, probably the biggest one with about 45 students. Sorry, I got a little fly here. Um, he's been around all night. Though. Yeah, he's been, he's been bugging me. I guess I spent, yeah. yeah. So um, that, was, that was a real positive aspect of the, of, the, uh, of the summer program, was having high school students volunteer their time there. Um, that's basically the gist of it. I mean, I, I could go into a lot of detail. I don't want to take too much time, but maybe kind of answer some questions. Um, I will show you the uh, every student that participated in the clinic got this uh, nice Middleborough Sachem's T-shirt, um, and uh, that was that was part of the registration fee. Uh, and next year, uh, just to, I'll, I'll kind of touch on actually the clinics. We I said we offered 16, and only 11 ran. Um, that was mostly due to combining clinics. So for example, uh, swimming and diving had three different weeks where they were going to offer three sections and we could kind of combine the students who'd signed up into one section because we didn't have the numbers to justify three weeks of swimming and diving. Um, the same thing happened with wrestling, which unfortunately that one got canceled. Uh, we, our football clinic, um, we had set our date uh, ahead of time and then uh, unknowingly on the same week that uh, the Parks Department was running a football clinic that they've been doing for years. Um, so we, we kind of um, you know, decided to cancel ours because we didn't want to make any conflicts for the Mitchell Memorial Club uh, football players who usually participate in that, that Parks Department clinic. So, um, and then one more combination of track and field. They had, they had offered three different weeks and only two out of the three ran. So um, I think going forward, we'd, I'd like to continue to expand the clinic uh, the clinic listing uh, to whatever head coaches are interested in offering. Um, and all the registration was done the same way our athletics registration is done through family ID and payment through Unibank. If I might, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Sylvia, the, in terms of feedback from participants and, and from parents, what have you heard? Um, was it positive? Was it generally positive? Yeah, in general, uh, I think the fact that we're offering so many different, you know, wide variety of, of uh, opportunities was, uh, that was a, the most positive feedback I got. So you had students who could participate in a basketball clinic and they could participate in a lacrosse clinic. Uh, in some cases, they could come in the morning for, say, uh, basketball and come in the end. I'm just throwing different sports out there. But one sport in the morning and another sport in the afternoon with only a small gap in between. And we had coverage for coaches there. Um, so kind of a, a long-term vision would be the possibility of the more, the more uh, sports and activities that we offer. Um, you could potentially send your, your son or daughter to camp at the high school uh, for the day. You know, the, the three-hour clinics in the morning and three-hour clinics in the afternoon. 
with some coverage if they're packing a snack and a lunch and things like that. So, um. yeah. uh, Mr. Sylvia just touched upon was what you've always talked about, we've talked about is opening this building up year round at night with things going on. This just has to be one aspect of it. I just looked at my son who went through the conditioning program and he was shaking his head. He, he loved the program, so that's a good thing. And it was very reasonably priced too for what you got out of it. It was very reasonably priced. And I think that the community can appreciate that too. It wasn't something that was priced way out of whack. It was 85? Yeah, it was, it's uh, basically 12 hours of instruction, four days. Uh, for the clinic, uh, three hours a day, and eighty-five dollars was the cost. And probably also important to just identify that any uh, any profit that we did make from running those clinics goes right directly back into the revolving account that um, you know basically supports the full athletic program, uh, whether it be equipment, uniforms, all that type of stuff. Just the same as uh, a user fee that you might pay to participate. We should also add, Ryan, too, that this year for the first year we're going to extend strength and conditioning throughout the school year too. Correct. Because you're going to have a strength and conditioning person there essentially after school all year round. Right. And the, the plan, uh, which we're still working out the details on that, uh, is to have someone in place after school for the fall, winter, and spring season. So uh, those student athletes that are not in season uh, have a place to train at the school. Uh, so maybe they can take the late bus if they need to or uh, they don't have to go over to the YMCA or go over to a private gym. Uh, it's right there for them. That's what's and Mr. Chair, uh, Brian Sylvia and Sean Siciliano have also been working on taking over the programs, which he had talked about before. And you might want to—I know you have a couple of there. Uh, yeah, we have. Uh, we, I, we, I, we have three fundraiser type uh, things going on, all from different entities, which is pretty cool happening at the same time in the fall. Uh, I have a couple programs that Sean Siciliano uh, helped us create. He did the majority. Of the these but this is the spring program and this is the winter program um, this year the inside will actually be full color it has pictures of every team from the from the season um, we don't have to flip through them all um, Sean did a really nice job designing these and what we do is uh, we, we send a letter out to all the area businesses in, in Middleborough and some of the surrounding towns um, with an opportunity to advertise in our sports program um, and these these actually become almost like a yearbook or a keepsake uh, and that's kind of how we try to uh, describe it to the businesses is uh, these don't get thrown away because they're pictures of, you know, people's children and their, their memories. Um, and also um, they, get, they get handed out at all of our athletic events, uh, especially the big, you know, we, the, the football games, the basketball games, the big spectator sports. But we do make sure we get them out to all the parents. Uh, and then we send one to a, every business that, that uh, advertises with us. Um, and it's been a... Uh, it's helped uh, put some money in the revolving account, and it also is a nice, a nice keepsake for students and parents. Um, so that is that's a, a, a fundraising effort uh, that has a lot of different benefits, but it's done just through just through the athletic department. It's not a MASPA fundraiser. It's not a ice hockey group fundraiser. Uh, so we have that going on right now. And the plug right now, I guess, if anybody who's watching is um, the deadline is is approaching on uh, sending in the, those ads to, to uh, be part of the, the sports program. So uh, any local businesses who are interested, all they have to do is contact me, uh, send me an email uh, to the Middleborough email, rsylvia at middleborough.k12.ma.us, and it's on the athletics website as well. So they can contact me that way if they're interested in advertising uh, with us. Um, so that's through the athletic department. We also have um, the MIG uh, Middleborough Ice Hockey Group uh, golf tournament coming up, uh, which is uh, an organization that, that works directly with uh, helping out, uh, helping mainly pay for the ice time for our hockey program because it's such a large expense, but also helping with other expenses uh, around the program. Um, and that is October 7th. 7th uh, October 7th. And that information is on the website as well. Uh, if you scroll down, um, there's a number of different icons on the athletics webpage and one of them is the Middleborough, Middleborough Ice Hockey Group website, and that's where you can get the information to register for the tournament. Um, and then lastly, we have our MASBA uh, fundraiser going on, the Middleborough All Sports Boosters Association, which just kicked off uh, for everybody but football today. Football's been doing it for a week, and I'll show uh, 
I know Mr. Giovanoni has, has his card already um, from Paul, but this is a, a discount card that has 40 uh, area businesses, uh, some in Middleborough, some from surrounding communities. Um, I'm sorry, there's actually 45 uh, discounts here that uh, if you purchase the card for $20, then um, you can use it at all these different businesses and receive whatever discount is printed on the card and it's good for the entire year. Um, the, probably the most attractive part of the card is the, uh, there's a small key tag that you, that you rip off on the side with the Middleborough logo and it's called the Athletic Pass and it gets you into uh, all Middleborough High School home athletic events that we charge a gate for. Uh, so football, mainly football and basketball. Um, and so uh, it's a twenty dollar card if you go to five home games. Um, it's five dollars or four home games. It's five dollars to get in. Um, it pays for itself just just there. So a little way to kind of boost maybe maybe boost uh, some community support and also uh, raise some money for the athletic program. And the goal, uh, no 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 fundraising effort is mandatory, but the goal is for every fall athlete to sell five of these. Um, and uh, and we're doing a blitz, what's called a blitz day on Saturday, um, September 8th, where we'll do a collection um, and then we'll send all the kids out uh, instead of practice for a couple hours around town, maybe stand outside Hannaford's or whatever it might be and uh, try to do one last push effort and, um, and see, what, see how we do. Right, since I don't know what time you'll be back again, uh, but could you talk a little about uh, we had a conversation. You're making a little bit of a change to homecoming. Can you tell everybody what homecoming is going to look like, the games leading up to homecoming and everything like that? Sure. Um, Mr. Brannigan and I are still working on the, the finer details, but basically uh, the homecoming game is going to be a night game, Friday night game. Um, and we have that spirit week that leads up to that Friday night game. So um, some of the sports, some of the teams will play their, their homecoming game, if you will, leading up to that Friday night. Um, and then also some of the teams will play on Saturday afternoon and Saturday morning after the football game, but before the dance. So um, probably the, the biggest change is that on Saturday we'll have kind of, um, we're, we're planning not a field day, but kind of a spirit day where we have a field hockey game, a boys soccer game, a girls soccer game all going on at once. Uh, and then obviously the sub varsity games that follow. So it'll take up most of the day leading up to the dance. Uh, we're going to try to do something with the food service, uh, with concession and offering hamburgers and hot dogs and things like that. Um, so that it's really homecoming is not just all about one one game on a on a Saturday. It's it's all of the student athletes uh, in the program. Awesome. Cross country, I think, is on a Wednesday, so they're they're kind of the, one of the first ones. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Ryan? Right. We we appreciate it. Uh, I mean, you stepped in this role last year and sort of took over, so we appreciate what we've done. We should also add that I believe for the first time in a long time, the athletic department came back in the black uh, this past year, meaning that there was, uh, there was a little money, uh, a little surplus of funds, which is always good for us, but as far as I've been on the board, that's never happened, and I'm sure Brian has the same uh, piece, so. Thank you for doing um, that. I think yeah, no, that was that was one of my goals, and part of it was the sports program that we offered um, for all three seasons. So that was a big help, and uh, kind of having a real tight tight budget the first year. Just um, and and Masba, the All Sport Booster Association, is really kind of grateful for that too because they have a, a healthy budget. And um, to me, that's the idea is we want to raise as much money as we can. So when a program needs something, a team needs something, a coach asks for something, we can say yes. Um, and Mr. Chair, what's happened in the past, as you know, is that the, the athletic department has used up its funds, and at the end of the year, the MASBA would send us a check for ten or twelve thousand dollars to balance the books. Now it's a different philosophy with Mr. Sylvia. He's doing the things he needs to do to keep the books balanced, and then when he needs something from MASBA, they're more than willing to 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 help out with with programs. They still run the Hall of Fame which is coming up the Saturday before uh, Thanksgiving. The, I think they already have their slate of, of uh, new inductees. But it is, a, is an, it is an active group, and uh, we probably should have them here at some point. And the, the MIG group also, I talked to the MIG group to see if they could send a rep tonight to talk about the upcoming uh, golf tournament, but they have their own meeting tonight about that golf tournament. So they could not make it here tonight. So. 
I think mass, but they've, they've been doing this mattress sale. Are they going to continue with that in the, in the February of range or January? Yeah, so, so what I kind of proposed to Mazba and they've, they've accepted is a, a major fundraiser in every season. And the mattress one seems to do a pretty good job. I think last year we raised close to $8,000 in, in, in one day. Um, so it, it's a pretty, uh, and, and the company that we deal with does a, you know, a nice job of dealing with most of the, uh, the heavy lifting there. Um, so the gold card will be the, will be the fall fundraiser. The mattress sale will be the uh, winter fundraiser. We have the golf tournament in the spring, but we may explore something that is, gets the students involved a little bit more in the spring. So we kind of have a, a, a student fundraiser in the fall, winter, and spring um, to really get the coaches involved. And wh while we're on the topic of it, I just want to uh, point out that um, I'm trying to make an effort to make our meeting, our MASBA meetings, uh, more inviting, more public. Uh, so our meetings are going to be held every, um, not that they weren't before, uh, they were always held in the cafeteria and we always posted the date, but we're trying to set our schedule and really stick to it as best we can, which will be the, the second Wednesday of every month. Um, so we'll get that posted up on the website. I know it's posted on the MASBA website already. And the idea is any parent um, who has student athletes or students in the Middleborough Public Schools is welcome to attend and, and you know, Un try to understand exactly what we're doing from a fundraising perspective and and uh, the MASBA board is completely open to that and inviting of everybody so um, you know we're all there for the same reason which is try to raise money for, for the student athletes and one more thing we should mention is the store is open currently uh, for people on the athletic website for people to buy uh, merchandise um, to go to games and sort of spirit merchandise yep. and we should also point out that that's essentially the only place you can get Sachem merchandise that we get a benefit for. So if you see Middleborough Sachem someplace else and that's not coming to us, the, the program, this, the store that's on the athletic <coughs> website is that program. Correct. And the, the athletic, that, that store does close. It's a, it's a one, it's a one time order per season. Yep. Um, we don't keep an inventory. Uh, Maz, Mazba does have an inventory at the football games of you know, some items, uh, t-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, but uh, to be able to order a specific size and a specific uh, item that we don't carry an inventory of, it's through that store. And the items are priced pretty reasonably. Um, they're not marked up to make any kind of major profit. Any profit we do make goes into the revolving account uh, right back to the student athletes. So. That's great. So, Thanks, Thank Ryan. you, Mr. Sylvia. Thank appreciate you. you coming. Appreciate yep. it. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the updates. The summer updates uh, conclude, and then we move on to some employment, employment status updates. Um, and I'd like to announce some new hires. And it, uh, Kiara Allen is an ESP for John T. Nichols Middle School. Patrick Converse, who was a music teacher at the Nichols last year on a fill-in for a year, has agreed to uh, join us as the .34 music teacher at Middleborough High School. Uh, Jacqueline DeMarco, SPED teacher at HPB. Edward Finch, health teacher at Nichols Middle School. Um, I'm going to skip over number five for right now. Then Joe Posey, ESP, Middleborough High School, high school MHS grad. Um, Josh Pooler, another MHS grad, ESP at John T. Nichols Middle School. Megan Riley, ESL language teacher. Very fortunate to get Megan. Uh, we were a little bit late in the season with the process, and uh, she was a real find. I'm looking forward to working with her. Uh, Courtney Setcher, kindergarten teacher, Memorial Early Childhood Center. I know that Mrs. Latenda went through that process. Um, looked through a number of applications, over 100 applications, and uh, I think we have a good one there, a great one there. Uh, Joanne Smith, coordinator of transportation. She took Michelle Ward's place, and uh, she's working out. She's working on the bus routes. Uh, finished the bus routes for the fall and has, I think they've already bid, the drivers have already bid those and uh, that's all set. And then Amy, Wall, Amy Wooler was a school psychologist Middleborough High School. She was, interestingly enough, she was a, one of the two finalists for the Nichols Middle School back in June and we were fortunate that she was still available uh, and we had a late resignation from the high school school psychologist um, just a couple weeks ago. So we, uh, through Kate Santos and she's moving on. Uh, we have some folks moving on, Carolyn Harrington, Mary Kay Good School, Ethan Lobenstein uh, picked up a job in Drakeit as a full-time music teacher. I know he's going to be missed at the high school. Um, Aaron Marr, the cafe recess monitor at Mary Kay Good, uh, and again, Kate Santos from the high school. So um, we lost some people, but we gained some really good people also. Now going back to number five, I'd like to invite down to the microphone 
Mrs. Heidi J. Latenda. Heidi is our new principal at the Early Childhood Center. You heard last meeting about the process that we went through to find Heidi. Um, and when I sent out my letter to faculty for this beginning of this year, in the faculty packet, um, I referred to Heidi as an old friend. And Heidi is an old friend. I first uh, met Heidi years and years ago when she did some twirling in front of the Chowder and Marching Society <laughs> down South Main Street and Center Street uh, as a younger, younger girl. And then I had the opportunity to work with her over at Bridgewater Rainham at my, uh, my old elementary school, Mitchell Elementary School, uh, for three and a half years. She was assistant there. She moved on to another school in the district and worked there. And then uh, when I moved on here, um, this job came up when Holly, the last day of school, came to me and, and resigned her position. And the position was advertised. And I assured Derek Swenson, the superintendent of Bridgewater Rainham, uh, <laughs> that I did not recruit Mrs. Lutsenda. Um, but she did apply, and she was interested in moving back home, if you will. And uh, so she's here before you today, um, well-educated, very experienced, knowledgeable administrator, um, great person, and we're fortunate to have her. So Heidi, welcome. Thank you, Superintendent Lynch. I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Chairman Mr. Young and school committee members. I'm very excited to be back in Middleborough, as I was the assistant principal many years ago at the Mary Good School. I was there for five years prior to moving on uh, to Bridgewater Rainham, and so I'm very happy to be back in my hometown where I can get back to the community and um, serve the students and the families of our town. I must say I've had a great warm welcome and I've been able to work very well with the administrative team who have been awesome and very welcoming and also the MEC staff so far, that the ones I've met so far, um, have been wonderful. They've been stopping in, saying hi, offering um, their insight, because I'm really trying to um, gain knowledge on the daily op operations of the building. Since I just started last Monday, I've kind of hit the ground running, maybe more like a sprint speed, and uh, just trying to get everything up and running for the, in, in two weeks. So, um, and I must say, Trisha Ferretti, who was here, she was working the ESY program, and some of the children referred to her as Principal Ferretti. So, and she earned that title very well for the summer program. Mm -hmm. She's definitely a hard worker and has been a great asset to me while I was getting acclimated to my uh, new position and new role and understanding the, um, the process of how things work at MEC. So things are going well so far. I'm very excited to be here. And um, thank you for the opportunity. And I look forward to working with all, you, all of you in the years to come. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Well, I just say welcome back. I, you know, um, my kids went to Mary Kay Good when you were the assistant principal. I worked with you on the school council yep. at that time and always had a fantastic relationship with you and I'm very excited to have you back here in Middleborough Thank and you. looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Very excited to be here. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much, Heidi. Thanks right. for Thank coming. You. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Uh, school choice update is next on my list, and I would ha be happy to tell you that we're up to number 43. I think we had another applicant today, so our numbers continue to rise in the uh, those numbers. Uh, I think Anne gave me hard copies, Ms. Gagnon gave me hard copies that I sent along to you. We'll make sure it's in the drop box. Um, did you get a Yes, okay. Um, so we have students from all over the area. Um, we have some employees, children. We have some t children who are just looking for a, a better education here in Middleborough. So we're happy to welcome them in. Uh, as you know, when, we, when I came in, we had uh, a, a school choice policy at that time that was sort of restricted to five students in the high school, senior only. Um, and this is quite a difference between those five and 43. Uh, it brings a great deal of money into the dist district, which can be utilized throughout the district. So um, kind of proud of that as we move on. Hopefully those numbers will keep going higher and higher. We need to obviously balance class sizes and make sure that we're, we're within our, our parameters there. Um, but we're looking forward to welcoming those 43 students from other communities uh, into the Middleborough Public School System. Some are already here. Uh, and some will be brand new. And as you see at the MAC, there are five that were brought in this year. We expanded that to five, and that very quickly filled to five. And we capped that for this year at this point. Um, and the numbers at the, at the MEC, I believe, are between 19 and 20, or 19 and 21. So the numbers are appropriate, especially with the uh, additional ESP we added in each classroom there. So any questions on school choice? I would like to point out just be, before I go 
beforehand too that we have essentially used this uh, money in the budget to fund essentially programs we didn't have. Yes. Um, so for example, we added the um, we added the special uh, ed teacher in the biology department at the high school mm -hmm. to help with that particular piece, especially around MCAS, and that has worked uh, wonders with that particular piece. I think we added an ESP out of this program too um, for the MEC. Um, so we've really worked hard to make sure that pieces um, were there and we were using the money to, to add to things so that essentially kids across the district would have an opportunity, have other opportunities too. Mr. Chair, yes. one, of the, one of the things about this program that I appreciate, I've watched it go from that 12th grade only, we looked at, then we went to just the high school then we expanded it down to the middle school. This wasn't something that was done overnight, which is great. We, 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 it was a measured way of doing it. We are, we're, I've always said, as long as we're on top of the numbers so they don't grow in a certain way that we end up having a big class or something that could, could, could hurt us down the line because we own our students from K through 12. We do. I mean, um, they, they are state put clause, so exactly. once we accept them, they are ours. And, and, but, uh, but I appreciate that we're watching it, we're balancing things. Um, the money is a, is a nice piece of it, um, but it's nice that the students want to be here, yeah. which, is, which is a big part of that, too. When you see that you have all these students beyond the full day K that you don't have to pay for, which is, which is a nice thing. Yeah. Um, some communities still have other issues, but uh, <coughs> there are other students even beyond that that want to be here, and their parents want them to be here, but got, they have to want to be here, too, or, sure. or they wouldn't be here. Um, and I think that this is a great, great way that we did a measured approach to this and um, I'm, I'm happy to see this because I, I started on this board seven and a half years ago saying, why are all the other schools taking our students yet we weren't taking any back? And I did ask those questions and I, I had some answers, but uh, I'll keep those answers. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Oakley has a question. Mr. Oakley. Mr. Chair, um, just uh, branching off of what Brian was talking about, um, uh, I have kind of two questions. Um, one of them you answered for me before, and I apologize. I don't remember the answer. But, um, but before I get to that, it, it, do we have any indication besides just being a great school district of, of why some of these students come here? Are there particular programs that draw people here? or is We have not really done that. We have had people that, that request to stay here. Uh, when, the number one reason is they move out of town. Mm -hmm. They might move next door to a different town, and they want to remain here because their friends are here and their, their social group is here. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times they'll do that. Sometimes it, we'll find we have, we're really new at the elementary level. So the research we have really at the high school, the data we have at the high school is the fact that those kids, usually are kids that want to stay here uh, as a result of possibly a move. So that's the number one reason right now. Mm -hmm. I think the number one reason will become, or partly become a brand new high school that we're building. And people looking forward to that saying what a facility mm -hmm. because the facilities can be an issue when you're looking around the region and you're looking around some different communities that have brand new high schools um, and, and brand new facilities and things like maker spaces and, and innovative innovation labs and things such as that and, and robotics programs and things that we're developing now a mm -hmm. um, little bit behind the eight ball we are ahead uh, our, our AP classes draw students in the ability for any student to take any AP class they'd like to at the high school, mm -hmm. as opposed to a restricted environment where they're saying, if you're in an honors class or above, you're the, you're the only ones that can take AP classes. So we have that sort of open enrollment, I think, which is, in, is, is inviting to folks. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there are a lot of factors. Do we have specific data on it? No. Could we provide it? I think maybe it's a good time to maybe look at those 43 students or if we get more and to ask them, why have they chosen Middleborough? Mm -hmm. And uh, but I think that's a good suggestion that that might be feedback that we we solicit from those folks. Great. We've yeah. also, I should add too that we've also seen a lot of staff members bring their uh, several staff members bring their kids to, yep. uh, to Middleborough too. So that's mm -hmm. that's one thing. So. Absolutely. And and then just uh, the second question was um, how much money per student um, that came in in this way? Did Currently five thousand dollars per student. Okay. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Yep. And if a student one of these students has any type of special needs then there's an adjustment for that, depending on what their, what their uh, services are um, that, re that they require. And there are different levels of, of money that's allotted to different services. Got it, thank yeah. you.
the Mr. Lynch. Um, you said we're maxed out on the MAC, right? We we allowed five. We maxed out at the MAC. We maxed out. We are. Were, were there additional? Did we turn away people? We did not. Okay. But we had three, and we opened it up to five. We immediately filled. Filled those two. So. And are we maxed out on any level? I think we're under. Was the high school twenty? I'm trying to remember. I believe we expanded the high school to twenty five. Twenty five. Okay. Five, yeah. Twenty five. Okay. And. We didn't go grade wise. Okay. And we said five at each grade level at Nichols, so we have 15 Nichols, so we have some spots open. So we have open plenty of room. So we add. do have some spots. All right. And we did say five each at, at the HPB and the MKG, and we're at nine there, so that's, okay. that's you know, one more there, and we're maxed out unless we expand it, so. Okay. Um, I agree with Brian. I, I think it's, I think we did this in a methodical way. We, we rolled it out and expanded it. At this point, since we're now allowing at every level, have you seen any inkling of some issues that might be coming up if we allow too many more to come in, or is there anything that's on your radar? I think the only thing on my radar would be, well, Mr. Stevens, would, would be a class size and okay. keeping an eye on that because um, we've, we've been, and unfortunately, we've been in a place where our class sizes, over the years where we've had our population go down, we haven't, we haven't uh, uh, we've retained most of the educators. Okay. So our class sizes have gone down as a result. Uh, and I wouldn't like to see class sizes going back up or looking to add faculty as a result of this. Um, but it is a, a bit of a quid pro quo that if we, if we add 10 MEC students, we that have the room to teacher. expand. So yeah. we could actually add another kindergarten if we mm -hmm. wanted to. Okay. And I would tell you that a neighboring town, Berkeley, where, where I happen to know the superintendent pretty well, uh, my brother, um, there were a lot of communities around that didn't have full day K. So we instituted full day K and he was able to support it by the number of students from yes. surrounding areas, and Taunton choice. mainly, who chose to go to Berkeley to go to the full day K. Mm -hmm. So it can be a program that is a program that, okay, if and then. Um, so if we have too many kindergarten kids that want to register, if we have 20 students that want to register, we could add another class mm -hmm. and, and be able to afford that. So, as a district. Okay. I think one of the things that we have to look at, too, um, I, I think expansion is okay as long as it's done in small waves, like we talked about. Part of the reason is because we don't know, and to, in my mind, one of the biggest factors is going to be what the new high school holds. And so, obviously, we see a lot of eighth graders go to other places for, for legitimate reasons. They go to technical school. They go to agricultural school. We really don't know if there'll be a shift to remain in Middleborough if there's a new high school. And so that's one of the things that we really have to look at in the next couple of years. And so it would be difficult to, to raise numbers very high uh, without knowing what, the, what those pieces are. And I would tell you this, that, that you know, I do monitor enrollments over the summer, but the, the high school as of yesterday was 755, uh, which continues to go on the uptick um, to a, an MSBA three formula process that said you know, in 10 years we're only gonna have 680 students in that high school. So, um, and I know also that there are 59 houses being built currently in the town under construction. Uh, I know also that there are at least 100 apartments being built currently uh, and developed in currently in, and possibly many more. So, um, f formulas are what they are. Um, but the MSBA forces you to build a school that's expandable. Um, so there is an area at the high school where if we have to extend it, we will, but they will only support. We convince them to go up into the 700s, and then they add another 15%. So the building is being, at, it's being built for about 800 students. Um, but um, we're a town with 70 square miles, and uh, there's no telling uh, what how much of that is going to be developed. I mean, we know that there are limitations and that there are, there are places that their houses won't be built, but they seem to be finding plenty of smaller places for, to build houses. They're squeezing them in. Um, so Especially we'll see what happens. Mr. Mr. Chair, yes. this kind of dovetails into the school choice, but it's not a school choice item. We talked about technical schools and where kids go. I'd like to have a number at our next meeting of how many Bristol Plymouth students are coming back to us this year. The actual number of students coming back. And I, I have 
I have had a few parents say to me they were highly disappointed in the fact that their student went there and didn't get what they wanted to be involved with. And it's not an uncommon problem at Bristol Plymouth. Some people go, they love it, they get what they want, <clears throat> but if they don't get their choice of programming there, why should they have even gone in the first place? And I want to say off the top of my head, it's like $26,000 a year for us to send a student over there. From the, the cost of the town, 26,000 per student. For, we spend 14 um, on average. And uh, I always, I, I always, we always say, why do they choose? Why? And I'm not saying there's, there's great programs over there. Tremendous program. I've even said, parents, you need to send your child there if that's what they want to do, and, and, and whether it's a, an electrician program or something. But to see the numbers coming back is what I'd like to know is how many we send, how many come back. Um, and when we talk about the why, the why do they come back? Mm -hmm. um, because unfortunately, I, I, to start a program and then make a switch because of just one reason, I, I'd really love to know. Yeah. But Some numbers we you, can certainly look at. If you wouldn't mind, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. If, uh, just just for a conversation, which I, I think is important. Um, I, I agree with everything Brian said, and I also agree with what uh, Rich said about the idea of looking at why people are coming here. I also think the inverse is uh, important too. We don't really look, we don't really survey our parents for eighth graders who go someplace else as to why they're going someplace else. We make assumptions, like you said, Brian, we make an assumption if a kid goes to uh, uh, BI, they're going to BR because they want a technical education. But, but we don't know that to be true. Um, and so I think that maybe this year we should really start to have that conversation because I would like to see you know, what the next couple of years hold when people go out and then what the, those responses are when we have a new high school. So I think that, I think it's the, the other piece too. So I think we need to look at that too. So I think that's important. Good. Thank you. No Thank problem. you all very much. Um, Rotary Rays was next on mine. And then finally on my report uh, was just sort of a summary tour that we're gonna do tomorrow morning at 10. If any of you folks can make it to take a walk through, we're gonna meet at the Henry B. Birkeland uh, front lobby at 10 a.m to take a walk through, drive through the school system and with Mr. Hutchinson. Um, and you can bring the babies, sure. Um, <laughs> but we're gonna just take a walk through and, and take a look at some of those projects that he listed when he was here the last time about the projects they're doing um, and, uh, and such. So that's tomorrow morning at 10 at the Brooklyn if you can make it. Um, lighting project I believe is almost complete. They're right down to MKG and I think that he's really trying to they have disappeared for a little bit, but I think he's trying to get them to come in and finish up. So we'll hear a little bit more about that tomorrow. So, and if you can't make it, I will certainly set it out in the Friday Flash, that update. So, and that concludes my report for the evening, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for our SBA update, we, uh, to be honest with you, I don't think we've had a meeting since our last meeting uh, because we completed the 60 cent percent submission and um, we figured out that we didn't need a working group meeting, I know. Um, and um, there was a meeting yesterday? I attended that meeting. There was okay. a meeting yesterday on the, uh, with the Middleborough Gas and Electric and the engineer for DRA and the OPM who are looking at the solar arrays for the roof um, and trying to make arrangements for uh, the bid process that the g and &E will have to go through and the timing of that. Uh, and the questions around the general contractor, whether or not the general contractor will allow us, uh, or allow the GE to be on that roof in the middle of their construction, or will, will it be a sort of post construction? Well, is that something they'll do in the following, we would wire it for them, and in the following summer after the school is opened, then that would be something they might go up there. But it's all timing, uh, and they're trying to work out the timing. Uh, it's been done in other schools. The engineer uh, who is is familiar with the process uh, spoke a great deal about the timing and the issues around timing. Also spoke a great deal with concerns from the G&E um, about uh, how they're held down. Uh, the G&E, I think, initially would say that they would prefer that they be fastened to the roof because of the issues with uh, 
wind, high winds, et cetera, and prevailing, uh, I believe the figure was 98% of all uh, the, the uh, programs on roofs the, are done with ballasts and waiting, and they're done for extreme storms and extreme weather. So uh, there was some discussion back and forth, but it was a productive meeting. Um, G&E has agreed to partner with us on this, which is great. Uh, it, there'll be a learning station in the school uh, where the students can monitor it through science classes, et cetera. Uh, there'll be a grant that we apply for to help pay for it, which will require us to have some type of educational component in the school. Um, and I'll tell you, if it's in the middle of a cafeteria, if I'm a high school kid, I, I'd be interested in probably checking that daily to see what kind of energy that those <coughs> uh, photovoltaic rays or, or uh, what are they called, PV? Go ahead, tell me, please. Photovoltaic. Um, they're not just called uh, what they used to be called. So uh, we'll be interested to see what they produce. So um, looking forward to that. And that's my latest. That's the latest from the MSBA. Um, the one other thing I should mention about the building committee is um, we just finished the audit on the MEC roof. Yes. Um, and I got to sign off on that. So I'm completely done with the MEC roof. And hopefully we won't have to ever talk about it again. <laughs> so for Real those sweet. who remember that being a constant conversation, yeah. I've never signed so many documents before in my life. So thank you. Um, consent agenda. Motion to approve the consent agenda presented this evening. Do I hear a second? Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. MASC, there's just the two things up there, which is the annual conference, which is November 7th through 10th, and also charting the course with the new members who are interested in going. They're still available and still going. Um, we are still going to have a workshop on operating protocols. Uh, I apologize for that. But this summer's been a little crazy, so we'll, we'll hopefully schedule that early in September, and I will send out dates to everybody. Uh, Superintendent su uh, Goal Subcommittee. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. So we worked with Superintendent Lynch, uh, met twice, and I think came up with six goals that we all agreed on. Do you want to go through them? Sure, yeah. Um, I do have some hard copies here. I don't know if, uh, I know they were placed in the Dropbox. And it was a, and, uh, so my six goals focus on uh, district improvement, student learning, professional practice goals. Um, first goal is a district improvement goal. Talks about student safety and security and expanding that for this year to include um, two school resource officers and two school safety officers who will be in place in the school and also have a uh, sort of a sergeant who will be in charge of that sort of detail, if you will, in the school department. And I'll be working with the Liberal Police and I'll be working with our DIRT team and to, to make hopefully that a success and also plan on sustaining that for the future. Um, goal number two is a district improvement goal, is an extending the school day year um, goal with regard to the evaluation that we've been doing over the last couple of years on our program to extend the day, whether it be for, before and after school childcare, uh, with some additional components, looking to have some additional educational components involved, uh, and looking to uh, put that in place for next year. Um, whether we continue with the YMCA or we go to another uh, service provider. Uh, goal number three is my communication with the Monroe Road Public School community and the, in addition to the normal communication with the Friday Flash and all the other communications that we do to expand to include a monthly newsletter uh, for everyone in the district, uh, parents, teachers, everyone in the district, uh, and also uh, a system where uh, teachers could, uh, any employee could directly contact me uh, and ask me questions and have discussions with me directly um, and not necessarily have to go through the normal protocols. Most people will continue to go through normal protocols, go to a, personal, uh, a principal first or an assistant principal first or go to a bus driver first, or, um, but there'll be an opportunity for people to directly contact me um, and then I can have a chat with them or a sit down with them and then process through that. Um, some people uh, just sort of need that and, and that's we're going to try to provide that. Uh, my goal number four is to collab coordinate and collaborate professional development with our administrative team. 
Uh, a lot of that has to do with a book uh, that was brought forward by Derek Thompson, principal of the Henry B. Berkman School, a uh, book by John Hattie and, Cla John Hattie and Klaus Zera uh, called Ten Mind Frames for Visible Learning. And we read it as a group of administrators, and we will, through the year, uh, have presentations from each building on how uh, that book and, and the thoughts behind that book and the research behind that book is being implemented in each of their schools and putting in a series of administrative meetings that include the larger administrative team, the administrative council, if you will, uh, and those will be uh, held on a regular basis also. Uh, my goal number five and six are pretty similar, um, but uh, both Mr. Stevens and, and, and Megan agreed that we should probably really monitor the Project Lead the Way grant and the ST Math grant program um, for their success, the level of success, the level of failure perhaps, uh, the level of involvement, and, and uh, they're both programs. One is a supplemental program and one is an integrated program. Uh, by that I mean that the, the ST Math program will be an addition to the elementary math program at each of the buildings, and the ST, the uh, Lead the Way program, Project Lead the Way, will be a program that courses are being offered at the high school. Uh, so sort of different approaches with those, but both are grant programs. Both are three-year grant programs, and uh, we're going to need to have data. We're going to need to have information. So with, as part of my process this year, I will work with uh, Dr. Gates and work with the principals at each of these levels uh, to monitor these programs, monitor usage, and monitor their uh, their feelings and success and failures of, of both of these grant programs. So those, those are basically a quick summary of, of all my uh, goals that uh, were agreed upon in the policy subcommittee and are being recommended by them tonight. Um, Ms. Janess and Mr. Stevens, you're welcome to chime yeah, in. To, um, say a few things. That's sure, absolutely. Okay. N uh, number one was a safety, ha in my mind, the safety had to be number one. Uh, you know, in the recent, uh, with the uh, Parkland uh, incident and the shootings, you know, adding resource officer and the safety officers, I think, were important. And the thing I would like to point out is the town, the police department, all came together to fund those positions for this coming year because it wasn't built into our budget because, you know, that happened late, late in the year last year. So the important work for us to do this year, and Mr. Lynch will certainly be uh, working on it all year is to figure out how we're going to expand those positions in our budget. Uh, so that's an important thing. Um, number two, the newsletter. You know, I just we, we felt that his communication with the school committee was excellent, and we wanted to expand it to everybody in the district. And the third one, the f goals five and six. I felt like I've been in teaching three years, and I think the thing I see most often is these brand new programs come in, they make a big splash, and everybody's excited, and then they just kind of fizzle away, and people don't really know what happened to them. So I think that we got two really good grants. I mean, I know people worked really hard on them, and I just felt it was important to f you know, just keep the intention going so we, we really know what's happening. You know, we don't want things to just kind of you know fade away and not understand what happened to them. So I thought I, I liked all six goals. I'm, in favor of it. Okay. Um, Mr. Lynch, when we first in initially met, had come to the table with a lot of these goals, so I just wanted to thank him for kind of brainstorming with us and coming prepared with something. But again, to kind of piggyback after, after um, Mr. Stevens, for five and six, same thing, I've been a teacher for five years, and they come in and they, they're all gung-ho about this program, but everybody has to get a certain proficiency level. And if you're not meeting that, then they're pulling kids from classes. And we just didn't want to see that happen. So we wanted to be really cognizant of how we were going to monitor this and that we had to monitor it somehow. Yeah. And, and Mr. Chair, through you, I've also been involved in the ST math program in the, in the past and sort of getting that going, getting that off the ground. Um, and there is an expectancy from the company and from the grant um, that their schedule be adhered to uh, on these grants that you get through the program and students get through the program. Um, unfortunately, uh, some other things tend to get in the way and the prioritization, it goes down, probably down on the list, if you will. And then there's pressure on the part of everyone to make sure that everybody catches up and everybody is on board. And I know I, I had a conversation with Mr. Stevens 
who was at the middle school science level and kids were being pulled out of his class to go down to the math lab to finish up the ST math because they were falling behind. So we as a group, I think, need to be carefully, uh, need to be conscious of that and carefully monitor, make sure that, that it's a supplemental program, um, that we administer the program on a regular basis, um, and that we don't compare folks to, uh, I got in trouble a little bit as an administrator because we started putting up a graph of, com of comparing what teachers had, com <coughs> what number of teachers in each class had completed, a certain percentage of it, and it, it, it became a little bit of a union issue at one point. So um, it, the success of these programs is important to us. Um, they haven't cost us a lot of money, they are grants, uh, but they need to support our, our, what we're doing in the school system, and we need to make sure that they're doing that. So um, I want them to be successful, we all want them to be successful. Um, but it takes some work, and, and, and that's going to go to the building level too. And these folks who work in these buildings every day know that it does it does take some does take some doing, and it's something that's an add-on. Um, so, looking forward to, to doing that. So, um, I want to thank you guys for doing this. Uh, I think all six goals are excellent. I think the three of you did a really nice job. Uh, I do want to point out a couple of things that I think are important. Um, one. Uh, Greg, you mentioned the first goal uh, being safety and it, how it affects our budget. I, I just do want to say that I did, and the superintendent knows this, the police chief and I had a lengthy conversation, um, and it would appear that the this year will be minimal to our budget right. um, because the chief's using funds that he has available to him to be able to do it. So I'm very thankful that that's clearly a cooperative piece between us and the police community. and. Uh, He's done a really nice job setting that up, so I, I did want people to know. Um, the second piece is, as far as goal number two, which is the after and preschool program, the superintendent and I have already sort of reached out to our worlds and had conversations with people uh, about what's out there, those type of things. Um, I think we're both in agreement that in order to do it right, we will probably have to set an RFP up probably early January. Um, and then make a decision by February. Um, that way um, the program can sort of get into place um, and be ready to go again, whether it's the Y or whatever program, it's all set and ready to go. And it, you function obviously with this year's class to get ready for next year's class. And so uh, I think, uh, you know, the other piece that I think will be important to us that I really want to do too is make sure we have public involvement in, uh, amongst the parents who send their children to those groups about what they want, what's working, what's not working, um, what needs to change or what they'd like to see changed and whether or not we can do that. So I do want to say those pieces. and So thank you. You guys did an excellent job in my opinion. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, no. Motion to approve the superintendent of schools, superintendent goals for fiscal year 19. Do I hear a second? Second. Discussion. Thank you. Seeing none, anybody in the audience have any questions? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Um, but we will be working on policy again. It's been a busy summer. <laughs> but we do have a lot of policies. Um, uh, to essentially redo the been some time the, you guys will see a lot of policies this year primarily because we haven't done policies in a while so we have to update and make some changes and obviously some of the policies that we run into are structured we, we don't have positions that we did in the past and so they change and so they also have to change uh, I put a reminder about the cable committee that's over we did the superintendent goals under action items um, so I, I did want to put down here, um, uh, Mr. Oakley and I had a conversation. Uh, Mr. Oakley is also a member of the uh, um, Conservation Committee. Uh, they meet the first and third Thursdays of each month. And I put down if we could change our dates to the second and fourth Thursdays of each month. Uh, just so everyone knows, um, I, I went back and looked at things. The second and fourth Thursdays of each month was the way the school committee previously operated um, when Ms. Franco came to the board she had a conflict with the uh, CPA committee was that right Brad and so they moved to the second and fourth uh, they moved to the first and the third so I'm wondering if there's any objection if no one minds 
if we could move to the second and fourth. So moved. Do I hear a second? second. Discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. The only other question I had was, I know there was a, a brief discussion, was just if anyone had any a desire to change the date. I'm not looking for the date to change to necessarily 6 o'clock. Time. Time, excuse me, time. I, I was wondering if we could do either 6.30 or 6.45. Uh, it just, the little bit sometimes helps, especially if we're doing it at that time. To be honest, in my mind, the earlier, uh, primarily because it makes it easier, we're gonna have lots of executive sessions because we have all negotiating to do. And just if people could, you know, it's easier to come rather than do one at seven or do one afterwards. So if we can get in here at 6.30 and do our executive session till seven, Again, this is all up to the committee if that works for people. So I'm wondering and asking. Thank you. Uh, I have faculty meetings till 5:30. Okay. No, that's so why. I, if we can maybe wait until the second meeting in September, so that I know what my faculty meetings sure. are. That sounds. And we, that's perfect. And I can let you know then. In, in, if you were talking about putting the executive sessions up front and then still starting the meeting at seven, is that what you're thinking? That's what I'm hoping. I think that that would be a good idea because. If you start changing the regular session, right? I don't know how many people actually watch it anymore, but if people are watching, they think seven o'clock is when it's always started. It's one of those things. It's kind of a cool thing. I like the idea of being able to start, whether it's 6.45, 6.30, depending on the type of executive right. session, we can make that adjustment. Right. So fun. why don't we have a conversation, Megan, after yeah. your first week there to see how that goes, the first couple of weeks. And then um, if it's, again, I. I agree with Brian. I probably try to keep it to seven. If we're not doing an executive session, my sense is, given the amount of contracts we have to do, we will be doing lots of executive sessions. Um, and so, to me, it, it just makes sense if we do them first. And also, um, you know, you sort of your brains have run out at the end of the meeting at times. Okay, great, Mr. Chair. Yes. Prior to anticipated adjournment, uh, I wanted to just re point out the fact that we had. Uh, oftentimes this summer we had classes that graduated from the old Memorial High School um, request to go in and do a tour of the building to see their old high school. Happened a couple of times this, uh, this summer and uh, the class of 1968 uh, sent along a hundred dollar check for the student activity account at the Early Childhood Center with the note, this is a small token of appreciation from our class for your assistance in providing us, uh, making a, the reunion tour occur. occur. So um, that's just, a, a, I just wanted to note that, that, that they, these classes that once went to Memorial High School, this has now become sort of a feature of their reunion. And it's happened a couple times last year and it happened a couple times this summer. So we're more than happy to accommodate those requests. Um, so if anybody from a class up to 1971 was the last class that graduated from that high school. Uh, would like to do a tour. Just let our office know and we could make those arrangements. Ooh, it's before that. It's, it's back to 27, the Memorial oh, Memorial High School. The Bates School is a different one. Bates School, we cannot do tours. You could walk through yeah. the parking lot at the town hall. That's about it. I have four bricks there, though. Yeah. From that, that school. Oh, wow. Um, Mr. Chair, yes. our next meeting is going to be September 13th based yes. on our new schedule. Yeah. So next meeting will be September 13th. Um, uh, the other thing I, I just want to point out to everybody, as I said, um, a couple things that the superintendent and I have talked about, is there are lots of people who go out of their way to help the district um, over and over again. Um, and we're really going to try to get them in here. For example, Chris Reedy allows kids from the uh, um, high school to go down and use the, his archery course. Um, so that's outstanding. And the other piece is obviously Hannaford's time and time again. Hannaford's gives us additional money over and over and uh, in a variety of ways. And if we look, I mean, the checks just total up and up and up and up, up all the time. So although uh, maybe not reaching a big check level, but given the amount of money they give over the course, I think we should really work. And, you know, sometimes that's, that's hard to do because corporations have different policies and things, but I'm going to try to reach out to the manager and ask if he or she would be willing to come down. Um, any other questions or concerns? And the chair, we're going to a motion to adjourn. So moved. 
We're here second. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you very much, and we'll see you September 13th.